Great, so welcome to my talk on birth of a monster, the gothicizing of insects in Fusilli Blake and Mary Shelley. I'm uh, presenting basically, which is uh, what is research I'm still doing at the moment. I'm working on a major article, which uh, is delayed like everything in COVID times. Um, and basically uh, it's to do with insects and the gothic and much more. Um, but first a prehistory, why insects? Um, you know, I have always been uh, intrigued in, in, in research that has, is sort of controversial or, you know, raises questions. And so insects, you know, if you asked me four years ago, why bother about the insects? I would have said, there's no point because it's very, very simple. There's the good ones, you know, I, I love honey or my whole family eats uh, pots of it every year. They're the good worker bees. Uh, you know, I still uh, have pangs of guilt about having squashed a bee at the age of five with a friend, um, still suffer from, from that. There's the bad ones, wasps, um, other creatures who are basically parasitic. Um, and then there's the, the weird ones, the, the ones we can't quite categorize, the, uh, the annoying ones that, that enter our Danish house here every spring. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen soon. So there's not really much of a controversy or, or problem to, to worth looking into, or so I thought. Um, um, now, about four years ago, I mainly work as a high school teacher. And uh, when ninth graders, um, they're always doing a speech on the topic of their choice, and they talk about climate change, and talk about sexism, racism, all about the, the major, major challenges. Um, and so I had this lad, uh, Daniel, with his friend, uh, rock up and say, oh, we want to talk about insects, about eating insects. I said, what? So he'd been to New York and uh, he had bought this lovely ice cream here, the photo that he handed to me with some crispy, crunchy uh, topping. Um, and I thought that was really, really interesting. I can still remember that, not the specifics of the talk, but essentially he was, of course, trying to make an environmental point about if humans were to eat more insects as opposed to, uh, let's say, uh, methane producing beef, we would be in much better place. But, but much more so, he really raised fundamental questions about why it is that certain animals are considered uh, edible or not. What, what, why, why some of us think, ooh, this is gross. And just to prove the point, he came along with cereal bars, you know, um, granola bars the, with, with insects flour, uh, not the same thing, of course, as, as bite into these crunchy insects. But there's something I think fundamentally odd and often understudied in the ways in which we categorize animals. Um, some of you may know Mary Douglas, Purity and Danger, a classic from the 60s, which I think lays out quite convincingly how many of these traditional dietary rules that have been there around for centuries are actually based um, on, on certain notions, sometimes very archaic notions of this fits into that box and that's why it's good. So for example, uh, the classic example she offers is with pork. So in Leviticus, the Old Testament, it says that animals that have cloven hoot, hoof and are uh, ruminants, like cows, they're, they're clean, we can eat them. Uh, the ones that have a single hoof and are monogastric, um, I don't know, just maybe horses or other animals, they're clean too. We love them too. But the ones that cross a boundary, like pork, I mean, like pigs, cloven heat, if you, but monogastric, they're odd. And I think in a similar way, insects often fall between categories, which is one of the reasons, I think, why they're often um, problematized or, or viewed as, as inferior or in, in some way strange. Now, a second thing that got me uh, started thinking about insects was in the same year, just a few months after that talk by a student, um, there were lots of media reports, you might have come across this, how there's a large scale insect collapse where entire insect populations just dropped in numbers. I think it was mainly based on studies in Germany where they did sort of, you know, looking across a field and realized that these numbers are nowhere close where they thought they were. Um, and um, I mean, I, I you may also remember this, how, you know, driving around in maybe the 90s or the, the, uh, the, the after the millennium, uh, your windscreen would always clog up with all the gooey stuff of these insects. And I remember, I remember being really kind of 
grossed out by this. Ooh. So I got to clean the, the con out of that, really. Um, but the, the interesting thing is also that when I heard about insects collapse, uh, I, I considered myself a, a, a big environmentalist, didn't have a car until the age of 30 and all that. So lots of biking and, and doing green, you know, making green choices. But when I hear of insect collapse, on the one hand, I pity the environment, but I don't necessarily feel for the insects. So, so, so to me, uh, to be honest, I mean, I'm still sort of locked in my paradigm where uh, they're, they're mainly biomass rather than, you know, living entities, which again, I think tells me something about how I categorize animals uh, or, or maybe how I almost de-animalize, how I objectify uh, these insects. The third point that got me thinking about the insects was um, one of my favorite texts, Frankenstein, which I've often done with high school students, is challenging, but really, really rewarding. And when kids get into it, they can identify with, with the creature and you know, the way in which he rails against his maker. And they can often very much see themselves reflected in that at some level. Now, there is this one key passage, the first time that the creature talks to Victor on the ice, um, something else, um, we have this exchange where Victor, um, well, the creature walks up to him and the creature is of course huge. We never give it specifics, but it's sort of an eight foot, whatever creature. Uh, it was just easier, I think, to make a, a big model rather than a tiny version. Um, and then Victor uses the word, be gone, vile insect. And I always thought this is so odd. This is so strange. Uh, my students would pick up it, pick up on it. We would talk about it. I would never had a good explanation why, why insect fits in there. Um, and uh, so I have a, some better theories now than I used to. I'll get back to the passage later on. But so my point here is that insects do crop up in many places, in many Gothic texts, sometimes quite unexpectedly like here. Uh, then of course we have all the major movies, uh, horror movies that, that make use of lots of insects in many, many different ways. But uh, my point is that I think there is really a long trajectory here whereby um, the, the way in which these creatures are represented, it, it builds on earlier traditions. Um, to some extent, um, what I'm trying to do is, you know, understand history, understand why we do insects the way we do. I'm also sort of getting really interested in this new trend called eco-criticism. I'm not sure how new it is. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's definitely picking up. So um, we all know how if we want to inflict harm onto an entity, uh, well, it's, easy, it's easier if it's an object than a living you know, being that we empathize with. So, so often there is an, a process of maybe objective education you know, a, a sort of a mental distancing before um, you inflict know, violence on something. And I think this is definitely something that's very, very prevalent with, with insects, you know, uh, they're, they're pests and you can, you know, basically use lots of means to kind of, you know, control them or harm them or hurt them, whatever. Um, and uh, so from an equal critical point of view, of course, the, the difference in power, or, you know, that is definitely a, a key aspect, but also, is it even possible? Is it possible to go beyond sort of an anthropocentric perspective where we always think of us humans? Is there a way in which you can sort of not only have a more holistic view or reading of the text or of nature of the world that surrounds us, but even of, you know, relationships of, of humans and animals? So, so this is something that I'm, I'm sort of interested in and, and working towards. Um, so we'll do a quick race through the ages from the classics or rather medieval sources, early more than uh, hitting the romantics, uh, and then a little bit on the post-romantic and uh, uh, an outlook and, and certainly time for question and answers. And a good starting point, I think, um, would be with uh, Noah's Ark. So you ask any uh, random um, person in the Middle Ages, you know, you, you have a certain creature you don't like, and you would ask maybe your local priest, well, were insects on the ark? Were they there? And uh, <laughs> um, so actually, could I, could, could I ask uh, one of the participants, um, Mason, were, were there any insects on the ark, do you think? What would a medieval scholar say? Um, don't know, my parents kept me out of uh, show studies uh, because we're atheists. Very good, anyone else? Um, have have their bet. 
were there any insects on the ark? Because, you know, think about the implications. If they were not on the ark, there's going to be a reason why they're around, because presumably all the animals that exist were saved by Noah. So anyone want to venture the guess? No. I just said yes. Sorry, you say I yes. hand up. Um, yeah. You know, and yeah. So um, Augustine, St. Augustine, who's a big shot, sort of, you can call him uh, pretty much the opinion leader, in, in medieval times, fourth century uh, church father, he says, no, they weren't, because it was not necessary. Uh, according to him, well, I mean, insects, first of all, they're not listed in the Bible in descriptions of, of, the, of the ark uh, as such. But secondly, um, he says, they can replicate, they can generate without, you know, being twos and twos. Um, this is from the City of God, which is basically a sort of a long text that explains many of the critical questions. So uh, basically there's this miasma theory according to which um, these animals, just tiny creatures just grow from the dirt somehow. They're basically dirt, um, you know, living dirt. Uh, so this is uh, City of God, book 16, chapter seven. Um, and he talks about, you know, why it is that in certain places that's life, you know, if you take Australia, how could it be life in Australia unless Noah had shipped some animals over there? So uh, here Augustine says, there's a question raised about all those kinds of beasts which are not domesticated, nor are, I'm sorry, so where I need to, nor are produced uh, like frogs from the earth, but are propagated by male and female parents, such as wolves and animals of that kind. And it is asked how they could be found in islands after the deluge, he said, et cetera. So um, insects are not specifically mentioned, but in the category where he says, nor are produced like frogs from, frogs from the earth. So, the point he's trying to make is that frogs, we know about frog spawn, uh, et cetera, but to Augustine, they just kind of grow out of, grow out of the earth. And so do the insects. So in other words, uh, the deluge couldn't harm them because there is what is also called spontaneous generation, which means the elements sort of produced them. Um, and so this is uh, the miasma theory, miasma from Latin, it means sort of, you know, fog. So think of a really thick fog on a hot summer day just before thunders, you know, storm break, break loose. This kind of storm supposedly uh, creates um, life, creates these little critters, whatever they are. So the poisonous breath of creatures of the marshes there in, in yellow at the bottom. And that kind of, um, well, what am I doing here? I'm sorry. That kind of, um, uh, theory is also continued with, you know, th throughout the Middle Ages, Isidore of Seville, who is famous for getting things wrong in interesting ways. So a bishop from um, the base in Spain. So he talks about of tiny flying animals. And uh, he says, um, quote, many people know from experience that bees are born from carcasses, um, for the flesh of slaughtered calves is beaten to create these bees. So that worms are created from the putrid gore and the worms that become bees. Simple. Same thing with a hornet. And what he does is, or it's very funny, he's sort of this logocentric. He reads the world through words. So um, he will say things like, um, I mean, he's also uh, very macho in a way. So he will say, oh, men are strong because the word, Latin word for man, vir, is related to vis, strength. And, and with women, the opposite, super sexist uh, <laughs> things he, he talks, uh, he says, and of course here with with insects, um, <laughs> this is pretty much a figment of his imagination. The hornet cabro is named from cabo, which is the pack horse. So they grow out of the dark. So this kind of logocentrism here, it rationalizes the miasma theory. So the idea that uh, these creatures are just kind of, they, they just arise somehow. And this is a widespread belief. Then interestingly, we see how these ideas are not just ideas, but they're also put in practice. There's something peculiar and slightly understudied uh, called animal trials in the Middle Ages, whereby animals are put on trial. Um, for, for example, in this in instance, um, there was a sexual assault and a violation, and uh, some animals were present, and because they witnessed and didn't intervene, they will also be um, executed or whatever, um, punished. Now, there is one uh, peculiar case from Switzerland where I grew up, which I thought I liked it a lot. Um, 
about the um, basically uh, a, a clerical court um, trying um, creatures that harm humans. And just to, to read out this one. Now, in, the irrational, impenetrable, imperfect creature, the inner, call imperfect because there was none of thy species in Noah's ark at the time of the great bane and ruin of the deluge. Thou art now come in numerous hands and has done immense damage in the ground and above the ground to the perceptive of divination of food for men and animals. Therefore, I do command and admonish you, each and all, to depart within the next six days from all places where you have secretly or openly done or might still do damage. Wonderful um, in the bizarre use of bureaucratic um, and formal language. It's, it's in, in translation, of course. Now, this Inger um, is uh, this guy. is basically the white grub of the cockchafer. And uh, one kind of indicator that is interesting, I think, for old sources, medieval sources. So note how there is a name, Inger, for the grub. And it's a very specific, it's not a particular grub that is called Inger, uh, nothing else. Um, often, I think, in medieval times, they had a very limited understanding of the life cycle of these creatures. So uh, did everyone know that the Inga be would become the cockchafer? You'd imagine that, yeah, you'd assume yes, but uh, there's often these stories, for example, um, the caterpillar and butterfly is an interesting one, where uh, there's a belief that the caterpillar dies and after uh, three days or three months or three weeks, um, the butterfly then, you know, goes out. Um, and of course, this would then be allegorized and, you know, couched in biblical terms. I mentioned the, the, the figure three because it would be like, you know, sort of Christ resurrecting. Um, in this instance, it's evil grubs that produce the cochafer, but did everyone really know that? Um, we need to recognize that the scientific understanding of the world was quite different in medieval times, and this will live on to the early modern period and, and even beyond. Here's a wonderful illustration from the 15th century, um, we have this lady presenting two things to their audience, to her audience. Uh, on the, in her right, she has flowers, um, and on the left, a creature which seems very insect-like. Uh, it's a bit unclear what the exact species it is, but the text uh, in Latin really gives us, you know, how it is to be read. Verum et falsum. That's the verum. It's the truth versus falsehood. Now, why, why would an insect be false? What, what, you know, is it, is it treacherous? Is it potentially poisonous? If I lived in Australia, I would not trust many insects. <laughs> Certainly not. Um, but there's many texts that speak of insects as unreasonable. And I found that very, very, very interesting. Uh, actually, it also comes up in sort of pandemic literature where we're talking about how, how, how certain things are not supposed to be on the planet. You know, how is it possible that we have harmful things here. How would, would God ever allow that? But the unreasonableness of uh, insects has to do with the fact that they're framed sort of as, as defunct creatures. Uh, and this legacy, you know, text, for example, from Aristotle, uh, Aristotle is, is, is a trove of interesting claims about natural history. So he says something like, all insects have eyes, but uh, no other organ of sense discernible, except that some insects have a kind of a tongue. Um, in another uh, instance, all insects, when cut into two, continue to live, except in such as a naturally um, call, of cold nature or uh, such as when their minute size chill rapidly. Um, the reference to heat is, is, has to do with humoral theory, which I'm not going to go into, but it's basically this whole idea that all bodies operate in a similar way vein with, with heat and cold. The cut in two, of course, connects with the fact that worms are sort of borderline insects. They're half insects, they're half uh, whatever else to them. But the, the main, main idea here is that insects are just improper, uh, I, mean, I mean, imperfect, um, and also further down with Pliny. All these animals have been uh, pro very properly called insects from the incisors or divisions which separate the body. Some of them at the neck, some of them at the corslet, and so divided into members of segments, only united to each other by a slender tube. Indeed, in no one of her works has nature more fully displayed her exhaustless ingenuity. Now, this is interesting, I think. So it's the idea that if you look at an insect, I can see how it has all these funny cuts and all these elements fit together. It's an organism, but it has a funny shape. It has sort of a monstrous shape, 
because of that, it must be impure. So the word insect, insectors, it's a bit like, you know, to dissect, where sect means cut. So uh, they have monstrous incisures, and that's why they are impure. So, uh, so, so this is kind of a key idea that will reverberate throughout. Now, uh, if you were to look at fiction, we're still within the medieval period here, medieval, early, modern. Um, some of the texts will pick up on these biblical myths, you know, not on the ark, and, and on scientific theories. Um, uh, Aesop's fables are not among them. Aesop's fables is, I'm listing it because it's the best known sort of text on natural history, uh, sorry, on, on, um, on, on the natural world. This is basically a Disney-fied version of, of, of um, creatures. So we have the lazy grasshopper, it doesn't provide for the winter, the busy uh, ants uh, labor, you know, constantly, and they will survive winter really, really well. So we have sort of an anthropomorphizing, a moralizing of the natural landscape. And here in this instance, there's not much um, influence um, of, of those teachings of impure insects. However, in texts like these, so this is uh, another collection of, of fables or tales. So in this instance, we have the grasshopper, the cabbage worm, and the beetle uh, together. And you can just by visually looking at the, the text, you know, you can see how they form this trifecta and they seem to be plotting something while the two lovers on the left are uh, essentially um, engaging in illicit, you know, love. So, so the, the, the visual kind of juxtaposes the two. So we're meant to see them as, as mirror images of each other. Um, so, so in that sense, there is very much a feeding of, I think of ideas of impurity feeding into the, uh, um, well, medieval texts. Also, of course, the famous accounts of the plagues of Egypt. Um, so <laughs> I've chosen this one because the illustration is wonderful. You can tell how, is a perfect example to demonstrate how um, in, in this particular part of Germany, um, the insects they know are the grasshoppers. This is what they're drawing. Um, what they're talking about are the locusts from Egypt, which look very different and just uh, from the very color. So, so they're trying to understand, they try to understand insects, not through experience, but through a textual legacy of, of yeah, well, a culture they're in touch with. So it's, it's, it's archetypal, it's, it's a topos, it's sort of a, a recurrent image that, that comes and goes. So uh, basically these, I think, are the cornerstones of the Western, of Western thinking on insects. We have a mix of biblical, legal, scientific, pandemic, folklore, discourse. Discourse is simply meaning a way of talking about them, a way of conceptualizing them. And often the way you speak about something, of course, reveals how you value, value something. Um, here, this is also, I think, a good way of thinking of animals. If you really want to go back to their roots, look at, look at the words that we use to, to describe them. So here in Denmark, Krupp is the common word for insect. It basically means creeper. Uh, in French, vermin, and of course also in English, uh, that is related to worm, um, which is basically um, an image of, of, well, you know, sort of the, the serpent. Uh, it's a biblical image. Then, uh, so, so Krupp and vermin is sort of more the, the idea of a sinful creature. Then uh, entomon and insecta, uh, Entomology comes from entomon. Uh, it's the idea they're monstrous because they don't, they're not a unified body. They're sort of a, a conglomerate of elements. Then we have two German words I threw in ungezüge, which means you can't sacrifice it. Uh, it's it's impure, you know, unlike a, a sheep or or sort of a, I don't know a cow, a, a valuable animal. And geschmeiß, even worse. It's just basically refuse. If we then look into the early modern period, moving towards the long 18th century, um, we have much of the same. But on top of that, we also have what I would call uh, the idea of, of insects as pandemic vectors. So um, just to clarify, at this point in time, people don't know about how, for example, the rat flea um, would spread the disease. But uh, they have very much this idea that 
because insects are impure, they must be carriers of you know, whatever it is that, that people suffer from. This, uh, I'm, I'm really, really happy I found this um, in some database on, on pamphlets. It's a German pamphlet, which and the title reads, it's a sort of basically an accurate natural. It says, Contrafeum is like sort of an, an, an actual representation of the massive locusts that attacked uh, uh, Milan in the year of 1556, sort of this whole um, swarm. Now, what's interesting is, uh, firstly, that uh, it's, it seems to be a fairly unreliable, fairly imaginative uh, visualization. Um, secondly, in the text, um, it, it also makes this claim that uh, locusts were responsible for the big outbreak of the Black Plague in 1348 to 50. Um, and uh, of course, no evidence given. That's just a, a claim. It, it reads and seems very sensationalist. What's interesting is that um, with a bit more research, I found this, um, which was basically a, a pamphlet that came out uh, 16 years earlier, uh, 14 years earlier, sorry, sorry uh, by a related artist slash publisher. So we have clearly, uh, basically, um, a good um, recycling of material um, and adapting of myths. Um, and, oops, I'm sorry. And so in, in, in essence, it's this idea that um, this insect is really more of a mini monster. Um, actually, the people in the museum where this is exhibited uh, link it to, to Pirauster, an insect-sized dragon. I know pretty much nothing about. Um, but so there's this idea that uh, there is more to this insect than just being an insect. It fits into this whole pattern of the monstrous and the really, really it's, it's a really troubling, um, basically a creature. Um, also, we have this idea that these insect swarms are a natural phenomenon, which is similar to uh, thunderstorms or blood coming out of the earth or basically a stranded whale. It's one of these supernatural events that have significance, that probably perhaps have also biblical significance. Now, um, since we are in the middle of the pandemic, it's, it's, it's interesting, of course, to see how these uh, insects are very much also framed or blamed for outbreaks um, in, uh, in, in very vague, ways that, that often doesn't quite make sense. So for example, here this uh, French physician, Laurent Joubert, and I quote, one can predict a plague when one sees an infinite number of those animals that the Latins call insecta and fleas and bugs and flies gather, I struggle to read this because I couldn't, um, yeah, gather, uh, which live in holes of caves. So anyway, it says the idea of all these creatures, they come up uh, from the ground that must herald. Um, a, you know, basically, they're all plotting to overthrow mankind. Um, quite similarly here, um, this is a Dutch um, entomologist, actually. He is the one who, we believe, discovered metamorphosis, or at least he is the first one to publish on it. And he also talks about how, basically, these insects trigger multiple diseases, and uh, so he talks about sort of the stagnant water. What he, what's interesting with this quote is that he makes a direct correlation of the uh, pathological potential, so the potential to infect in, in insects, which uh, deep honest is, is, is real, is true, uh, or is not simply to be dismissed. But then his reasoning is that it's because, and that's in yellow there, the second bit, because they stir incessantly and they're odd. So it's something to do with they're viewed as impure, and that's why they must be pathological. It's not based on any sort of hard evidence. There is lots more writing here. Scorpions, which are technically speaking, I think part of the spider family, I believe, not insects, but so the reasoning goes, because they're poisonous, we can also use them as an antidote. So basically scorpion oil cures the plague. Done. It's, it's, it's um, a belief that you can see uh, carried over for centuries. Here we have, well, there's a couple of historians who tell us funny tales about how supposedly um, some of the major plagues or pests or whatever they were, epidemics, 
were triggered by, by insects or follow basically an observation of, of insects. Uh, in this particular case, I think it's also that people ate insects. Um, so it says that uh, it was only when the poor people were like abstained from the greatest of dirt and from foul and filthy insects that finally the pest follows. So again, we have the pairing of dirt and insects. Uh, do you remember miasma, what I mentioned earlier? How insects supposedly just grow out of the dirt. So dirt is also a very interesting word or concept. Dirt is something that's not defined. I mean, it's basically when you say dirt, it, you mean it's some kind of organic waste which contains presumably uh, things that don't fit into any category. And so it's, it's a perfect representation of what an insect is. It's a creature that is not logical, that doesn't fit into a, basically a pattern or a group we respect or, or want. Um, here, John Smith, wonderful, wonderful quote. Um, Sam, could I ask you to read it out to give me a, a tiny break? Uh, yeah, no probs. Um, the Indians conspired together to plant no more at all, intending thereby to famish the Spaniards. The plot took such effect and brought them to such misery by their age of famine that they spared no unclean nor loathsome beast. No, not the poisonous and hideous serpents, but eat them up also, devouring one death to save them from another. And by this means, their whole colony well near suffered, tickened and died miserably. And when they had again recovered this loss by their incontinency, an infinite number of them died on the Indian disease we call the French pox, which at first being a strange and an unknown malady was deadly upon whomsoever it lighted. They had they a little flea called nigua, which uh, got between the skin and the flesh before they were aware, and there bred and multiplied, making swellings and putrefactions to the decay and loss of many of their bodily members. Thank you. Um, so it seems to me this quote, actually, this text stands out from much of the rest that I've read in the sense that it seems he actually appears to be a fairly interesting, quite reliable and, and, and fairly reasonable voice. So he, of course, talks about how um, the Spaniards failed and how their colony hopefully will not suffer the same fate. Um, we have insects being mentioned in Nigua, who um, it's, it's always extremely hard to tell um, are the, the insects named here equivalent to the insects we know nowadays, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but he makes a connection between colonial landscapes or uh, exotic climate, um, unknown creatures and diseases, which uh, will be quite um, defining for, for basically colonial adventures. And uh, so I'm using him as, as a transition uh, to move to other texts where insects are often used to essentially, um, you could say, other or disenfranchise or, or, or simply, you know, dehumanize um, certain groups. So John Smith doesn't do that. But it is done, for example, here in a text from, by Sebastian Brandt where uh, it's basically anti-Semitic uh, uh, propaganda, you could call it. And it's clearly done by showing the swarm of insects around uh, this, um, this, this priest, or I, I, I don't know the exact term, uh, from the 16th century. Uh, here's a really shocking example uh, by somebody called Georg Franz Müller. Um, he basically hired with the VOC, the Dutch colonial, uh, Company, if you've worked with colonial texts, you will know this. It's basically the, the I think, I believe, probably the world's first share company. It's very, very powerful. And it has uh, basically, it, it operates in, in, in the Middle Passage and in other, other places. And in his diary, uh, you find this drawing with uh, where basically an inhabitant who, who suffers, a local who suffers from a skin disease is labeled as a kakarlak, which is a cockroach, which is an incredibly insulting and dehumanizing and, and awful uh, way of labeling. And of course, like so many other, it's, it's so many of these metaphors, it works both ways. It basically entomologizes, and I can't say it, entomologizes otherness. So basically it represents, it, it, it animalizes the human but it also uh, devalues, of course, the animal. So it works, it works both ways. So um, the romantics are also, I think, really, really connected to, uh, to what's happening in the colonies. Um, and I think a lot of research is being undertaken at the moment uh, to see how the Gothic is also inspired by the horrors. It's connected to the horrors of the West Indies. It can also be a subtext, you know, something like 
Coleridge's Rhyme of the Age of Mariner, where you have, you know, a story about, you know, uh, a traumatizing journey at sea, essentially. So colonial context, keep, keep that in mind. Um, another thing that is relevant, scientific discoveries. So just before the, uh, the Gothic kicks in, we have uh, major scientific discoveries. And uh, we also have Swamadam who discovers um, what is basically, uh, well, he disproves miasma. He says this whole thing of, of the dirt becoming alive is just rubbish, that, that is not to be trusted. Um, he also is uh, the first one who discovers it's not actually, uh, previously everyone thought it was a king bee, but no, it's a queen bee. It's a queen bee that produces its, uh, you know, uh, a bee population. And he also disproves this whole Aristotelian idea of an organless, a flawed kind of, you know, insect uh, population. So major, major things happen. Also, just a, a quick aside, the uh, scientific discovery is also, I think, connected with, with uh, Linnaeus, uh, the Swede who has a classification system. That classification system is also in some way related to, to uh, racial theories at the time. Um, now, so basically, uh, this is just, uh, um, I'm sorry, Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, again, shows how the ideas of Svamidam was not just local, locally accepted in, for example, um, the Netherlands, but also in England. So he's, he's kind of mocking this idea that, ooh, there would be vast numbers of creatures just kind of, you know, entering the body with a breath. Um, so basically, he, he is, is trying to debunk theories, but because he's Defoe, he is never quite telling us where he stands. So he then says, oh, but, but maybe who knows? I will tell you more about that later. Um, a last thing before we, we hit the Gothic for real, this is Robert Hooke, who with a microscope, with his microscope, uh, gives us a huge representation of a flea. And so this is um, basically a, uh, well, a fold out page, uh, a double fold out page and it's massive. You can see on the left hand side what the size of the regular book is. And, I do think that with insects, talk about size is a crucial thing because you know it's something about how we perceive them in our minds, how big they are, the space they occupy within us, but also the power is often connected with the numbers, but maybe also it's, it's kind of size related in a way. So the birth of the Gothic insect, my whole premise of this talk, and it's taken me a while to get to this point, but it was important to lay the foundation. So is the gothic insect that we'll see in all the horror movies, in all the other texts I'm gonna talk about, why does it come about? I don't have the answer yet. I do think there are, these are some really good, important, relevant factors. So it seems to be often connected with, with the idea of metamorphosis, the idea of change, which has been a human fascination for centuries. So how is it possible that they change and what's gonna to happen to them and what kind of gross things will happen in that uh, very idea, in a very moment. Um, so we also have the idea of exotic creatures kicking in the colonial context, the, the, the insects you would encounter as you travel, as you go move outside Europe, which is a fairly safe place, uh, entomologically speaking. We have pandemic disease fit, fitting it into it. And potentially uh, what I mean with likeness is if you accept along with Spamadan that insects have organs, um, then they're not defunct, they're a little bit like us. And isn't that troubling? Isn't that worrying? Um, and when you hear the text of Frankenstein, you know, it's all about telling the creature, you're something else. You're, you know, I can hate on you because you're not like me. Um, in, in those kind of texts, I think maybe this insect versus human distinction becomes important. Now, um, you will not heard, have heard of this guy, Johann Castor Fusli but probably of his younger brother, Fuseli, the painter. So they grew up in Switzerland. Uh, this is the elder brother who uh, in his short life, um, he made basically a catalog of insects. Uh, this is a drawing he made. He, I don't think he produced lots of artwork. I mean, on insects, he was an artist as such. He's an art teacher, entomologist. His brother, of course, um, produced all these fascinating texts, uh, best known for the nightmare. Um, and then here, um, he also had a series on Shakespeare and uh, adaptations of Shakespeare. So we have Ariel surfing on a bat, 
And many of these texts then also use insects. Um, and uh, so here we have um, something on Midsummer Night's Dream. So Puck um, is next to a creature uh, that is kind of imitating what Ariel does pretty much and uh, seems to be doing pretty well. Um, we also have what I think is interesting, the, the googly eyes of this moth is not unlike the eyes of the horse. It has slightly different um, color perhaps, but seems to be, um, you know, a similar kind of um, iconographic element there, sort of the googly eyes, watch out for those. Um, I'm gonna skim through a couple of images because this is, I think, um, just to demonstrate the range. He usually has his little kid on the bottom left corner, uh, spatially marginalized, you could say. Typically in, in the arts, what's in the center is of course the most important element, which is bottom here, surrounded by the fairies. So all attention is on him. But then we also have this, this creature here, you know, this, this kid on the left. Um, and, and while this is sort of a, an endearing, I don't know, not a really a troubling image, it fits into a larger pattern where we have these humans who sort of, you know, turn monstrous or turn insects uh, some of the way. Here's another one. Um, so he produced multiple versions of, of similar motifs. In this particular case, well, we have sort of a quite sexualized version of this mothman who basically flaunts, you know, his powers and does some kind of, you know, jump. And, and what a contrast to the fairy to the right, which, which looks at him. So we, we basically have sort of the animalization or the, I don't know, entomology, uh, entomology, I can't say it. Um, humans turned into insects, basically, uh, is what we have. But they're very interesting. Um, and, and in some ways, the wings also, I think, align with the, with the ass's ears of bottom. So there's the sense in which uh, it's not just that little moth creature which lives on its, which is on its own, but but it ties in with a whole pattern of uh, potentially disturbing uh, metamorphosis. And here again, Mothman also uh, compared the googly eyes to the uh, nightmare, the mare, the horse. Um, and I'm showing you this version. Uh, it's an alternative version to the first one because what I find really interesting. It's just a theory, but look at that strange pose of the woman on the bed. I mean, how strange, how overly dramatic, and especially also with a raised uh, uh, knee there. I mean, it's, I mean, this is pushing it a bit far, but I would argue that she almost looks insectoid in her posture. It's almost a bit like, you know, kind of a spider or some kind of, it's, it's odd. Uh, it's just a way in which is contorted, which is typically uh, a way in which insects are, are, are portrayed as being just, you know, out of sync, not normal. Uh, the Changeling by Fuseli, this is earlier. Uh, I think it's before he left to London or to, the, uh, to England. Um, so the Changeling is this figure that basically, I believe is left behind in, in, in lieu of a child while the, while the spirit kind of flees. And so we have the spirit or whatever it's called, I, I wouldn't need to look up the right term for that. It's a bit like an insect or just left behind in my view is a racialized image of a Western child. So again, here we have a really, really interesting, I think, inter, interlinking of insects um, and, and of, of the racializing of otherness that we often see in, in texts and, and we sometimes see them in, in Gothic texts. So uh, Blake, who loves nature, he will have poems. This is from the uh, Songs of Innocence Experience. Um, a dream, which is about the Emmet having lost his way, little ant, and is being helped by a glow one. So it's basically a, a, a Disney-fied version of, you know, someone is in trouble and is being helped. Um, the sick rose, uh, I think, has more that, I'm just showing this kind of to contextualize, his, show his range. So the sick rose is about the rose that's being attacked by a worm. And the worm in Blake, who is deeply biblical, is of course often a representation of well Satan or evil spirits, but now um, the the worm is actually a caterpillar. You can see him you see it represented on the top left left the corner. So it's actually a bit a bit uh, um, unclear. I mean, it's, it, this is sort of a, a text that opens up many many different avenues. So 
what is so troubling about the worm? And um, we also see how the caterpillar is then linked to the humans which uh, are lying on the branches. Um, and um, anyway, so I'm going to rush on, but, but this is definitely a text that kind of raises a couple of questions. Here, this one, Ghost of a Fleet, so interesting. Uh, so Blake has his vision, has, he, was, he claimed to have these visions often in dreams where he would you know, be visited by the spirit of his, dead, of his late brother who died as a child or as a young man. Um, in this particular case, he dreamt apparently of a flea. And um, he was then penning down his thoughts. And so we see the sketch on the left and we see uh, the, the flea on the right. What I find really, really fascinating about this is that the flea, I mean, on the one hand, it's sort of this interesting blend of insect and human, um, but also it occupies a space. Uh, he occupies a stage. He's kind of you know passing from right to left. Um, here a little, by the way, how in, in cinematography often, uh, because we'll read from left to right, um, that is going, moving from right to left is counterintuitive. And often in films, you know, the good guy comes from left to right. The villain will come from right to left. That's what the ghost is, is doing. He's ignoring us. He's moving somewhere. Um, and uh, anyway, so sort of, this is a, a very kind of a troubling vision of the flea. Uh, this is quite unlike, maybe some of you know, uh, the flea by John Donne, where it's about the parting of two lovers and ooh, uh, and, and basically, you know, we were bitten by the same flea and that's why we have a spiritual bond or even a physical bond. And so, so this flea is much more, much more disturbing, I would argue. Here's one, a pestilence, where pestilence is personified in a fashion that I think is reminiscent of, of an insect. And uh, which brings me back to Frankenstein, I mentioned it earlier. Um, so in that particular passage on the uh, composition of the ice, we have, this is just a very quick uh, run through. The creature's created, uh, but is, is, is shunned, Victor runs away. The creature must grow out grow up on his own. He will then go back to Geneva, um, basically where Victor lives. He will uh, kill uh, brother William. Uh, the governess is, is executed because she's framed for that murder. And then Victor and the creature meet on the ice. The images are from, are from the Branagh version. And then we have this passage. Um, would you mind uh, reading this, Sam? No problems. As I said this, I suddenly beheld the figure of a man at some distance, advancing towards me with superhuman speed. He bounded over the crev crevices in the ice, among which I had walked with caution. His stature also, as he approached, seemed to exceed that of man. I was troubled. A mist came over my eyes, and I felt a faintness seize me, but I was quickly restored by the cold gale of the mountains. I perceived as the shape came nearer, sight tremendous and abhorred, that it was the wretch whom I had created. I trembled with rage and horror, resolving to wait his approach and then close with him in mortal combat. He approached. His countenance bespoke bitter anguish, combined with disdain and malignity, while its unearthly ugliness rendered it almost too horrible for human eyes. But I scarcely observed this. Rage and hatred had at first deprived me of utterance, and I recovered over only to overwhelm him with words expressive of furious detestation and contempt. Devil, I exclaimed, do you dare approach me? And do not you fear the fierce vengeance of my arm wreaked on your miserable head? Begone, vile insect, or rather, stay that I may trample you to dust. And oh, that I could with the extinction of your miserable existence restore those victims whom you have so diabolically murdered. Thank you. I think we can stop there. Thank you. Well read. Um, yeah, so this is this odd, strange, strange passage about divine insect and being a vile insect. And, and the way in which, for example, my students have often read this is they would say, oh, you know, it's about one of these, one of these moments where in, in a movie where basically you challenge an opponent you're afraid of. And so you do, you do sort of the guy talk sort of, you know, I'm not afraid of you. Of course, it has this real um, uh, element of absurdity here because uh, <laughs> just because of the sheer difference in size. Um, and also, um, but I think if we just keep in mind all the, the points I've been making earlier about the history of insect, Sense. I mean, one very, very obvious subtext to this is the fact that 
the insect, well, is that the creature has been stitched together. He's been sewn together. If you think of the insect as a creature that is being cut into, which doesn't consist of a single entity, but it's supposedly a monster conglomerate, then that's what the insect is. So there's definitely one very, very clear uh, subtext. Another one, you could say, well, all the insects, you know, were insects on the, on the ark? Well, would Victor's creatures have been, have been on the ark? Well, technically not, because how did he, you know, he was made, he was created by Victor. Is he part of the creation? There's a lot of strong biblical subtext in Frankenstein, um, but so it's almost as if Victor has kind of bypassed the natural route. So he has created something that Pliny or Aristotle would say is a flawed creature. So there's many ways in which basically he doesn't fit into the right categories. Um, also, I think we in the novel have very much this, it's almost a trial of the creature, sort of, you know, the creature pleading saying, I can be good. And this is what he will say like later on in um, the last line, make me happy and I shall again be virtuous. Um, so do you remember the trials, the animal trials, where we would say, ooh, you grub, you did not respect man, therefore we will terminate you. So um, he kind of pleads for himself. So there's many, many ways in which I think this insect can be linked to different uh, contexts. And also just to add too, uh, Mary Shelley was of course the daughter of two, um, uh, of two important writers, William Godwin, the philosopher. He uses insects in a similar vein. Uh, this is from Caleb Williams, who basically is, is, is an everyday character, every man character. He acts as a servant uh, to Falkland. And uh, Falk, he then he wants to quit the service. And Falkland says, no, that will never happen. I shall crush you in the end with the same difference that with any other insect that disturbed my serenity. So, uh, and he uses about five references to insect in, in a similar vein. Now, her mother as well. Well, Mary Wollstonecraft in The Vindication of the Rights of Woman. This is super interesting, I think. Um, she says, make them make women free and they will quickly become wise and virtuous. Echoing what we just heard with the, the creature wanting to become wise and virtuous. As men become more so, for the improvement must be mutual or the justice which one half of the human race are obliged to submit to, retorting to on the oppressors, the virtue of man will be worm eaten by the insect whom he keeps under his feet. So if you don't respect women, if you don't give women their rights, they will be crushed like insects. Um, they'll be worm eaten. Um, I just think it's interesting how the idea of human rights and justice, et cetera, et cetera is, is kind of, again, connected to that very idea. Um, Sam, I have, shall I continue another five minutes? Um, and, or what is it, what does it look like? I have- We've got Five minutes left. So I can wrap up. In, want... Can I wrap up in five minutes? And yeah. I can do that. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is just kind of a, a quick listing of how I see ways in which Wood could read, for example, the insect reference in in, in Frankenstein. It could be done in different ways. It's an unnatural insect. It's uh, born of unnatural generation. Um, it's such such. It's, it's nocturnal uh, and uh, it represents a wrong individual. Now. Post-romantic text, this is from Wonder Vision, which just came out this year, um, where basically a Wanda is being caught by this um, other witch and tormented with an insect. Um, insects are really, really very, very prominent. Just to pick up two examples, um, many, of course, you will know Kafka and Metamorphosis, which in German is called Die Verwandlung. Uh, and I'm, pick I'm picking it out because that there's, there's a lot going on in that just very first sentence, which reads, one morning when Gregor Samba perhaps awoke from troubling dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a horrible vermin. So it's a idea that he becomes vermin, which is something undefinable, which is much more troubling than knowing what you are. So he becomes some kind of refuse. The original uh, in German says, um, uh, it fand sich as ein ungeheuer ungeziefer verwandelt. Just the last three words say ungeheuer ungeziefer verwandelt. So ungeziefer in green is a word that only exists in a negative. It's a non-entity. He has become a non-entity. Um, and verwandelt is, has an echo to uh, basically transubstantiation, the idea that a blood becomes, you know, wine becomes the blood of Christ. So there's something 
spiritual and strange going on here. Anyway, so I just thought that is definitely relevant. And then uh, finally, Silence of the Lambs. Uh, I just watched some of it this morning after breakfast, um, <laughs> which is always, it's just genius film. And I do think that it plays so much on this idea of Buffalo Bill, the main, the serial killer who kills um, women to basically use a skin uh, that turned into a suit that he can wear. So it has something to do with, so his warped condition ties in with the zero of metamorphosis. Um, of course, also uh, we have very much the idea that these moths, I mean, they're nocturnal, they're defunct. And I, I use defunct because we see early on in the movie how entomologists cut up that insect, which is on one hand gross, but I think also it creates in so many of us the sense of curiosity. We don't understand insects. They're still, even though insects are the most populous creatures on the planet, we don't, we don't know them. Uh, we just see grossness, which supposedly is a fluid that has so many different functions and hides or includes certain organs. Um, so, uh, but basically we have, uh, I think, a way also in which this insect becomes uh, something that is uncannily significant. It, it, it speaks supposedly. Um, look at the shape. I mean, on the left hand side, there is sort of what it really looks like. And on the film poster, you can see how the skull has been, uh, I don't know, amplified or, or exaggerated as if the creature knows what it means, as if it's, it's very, very appearance is trying to make a statement. Um, and of course, the fact that the killer places them in the throat also shows how you know, this is the way it's supposed to be read. We then have in the movie uh, also ways in which Buffalo Bill himself becomes a moth. And, and look at this, how the dominant pattern, I think of his shirt, which is constantly in the frame and he kind of takes up a lot of space is very reminiscent of the kind of the brown colors. It's all kept in these brown tones in this very, very distinct pattern. And also here, if you just look at the way this is shot, sort of this brown palette, I would argue, is very much a specialization or a way in which it ties in with this moth light experience uh, or, or, or being. Um, he, he, he talks in a, in a funny way, um, in an almost kind of dehumanized way, it seems to be sort of, you know, poking, I don't know, touching his nose constantly. Um, and then we have a phase in which uh, in the opening, as, as as the detective visits his place, she goes through this dark space as she enters his sphere. And there, forgive me saying this, I think we enter his miasma. <laughs> look at the fog, look at the thick air. And she then spots a, a moth. And this then moves over to basically the shots where she is in the basement. And what he wears, the goggles, they make him look like an insect. So with a bit of imagination, you can see how there is a lot going on there. Um, I'm maybe pushing it a little far, but I think it's kind of interesting how they replicate iconographically the insect potential. So um, as to, to wrap up, uh, what, I've tried, what I've tried here is basically to offer ways in, or a suggestion how one can do an ecocritical or an entomological reading of insects. Uh, to what extent can we move beyond our human outlook? I'm not sure we can. To what extent can we move beyond our Western outlook? It would be really interesting, I think. Um, I'm also putting out uh, here on the left-hand side, this person who's collecting uh, cochineal, I think they're called, fleas, which are, or, or insects which are used for making um, color. So there's a new trend in criticism, which is called materiality. You look at the material that's been used to make a text and what it signifies. Now it's interesting that uh, when Blake paints the flea, he uses uh, red color, among other things, and the red is made from fleas or from insects. So he uses insect substance to human to make to portray insects. There we go. So um, yeah, I, I think there's lots of potential here, um, and um, I'd be of course very very curious to hear from you what you think about any of the texts uh, presented or any of the ideas suggested. And um, thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you so much.